Welcome to Awesome Astronomy. It's episode 9, I believe, for January 2013. We're all still here, we're all still alive. We're back for a new year, 12 months of Awesome Astronomy ahead of us. Actually, a lot of Awesome Astronomy this year. And uh, I'm Tom, and joining me is my co-presenter, Ralph. Ralph. Hello! Good to be back in 2013. It is pretty good to be back. How was your break? Yeah, pretty good. Nice and relaxing. Lots of uh, dark skies, although... um... What? There hasn't really been any that. dark skies, has Yeah, there? lots of dark skies. Where were you? Well, been lots of. Uh, we've had quite a few clear nights actually. Um, that back is end true. of December, there was a lot of clear nights. Although the forecast said there wasn't going to be any, but uh, but uh, what are the forecasters now? Yeah, there, there were a few clear nights actually. And, and we've had some great views of Jupiter because it's not been far past opposition. So um, lots of uh, imaging of Jupiter, and um, and with it not being far from opposition, we've had some wonderful transits of the moons across Jupiter and yeah, watching the shadows true. going across. It's been uh, it's been a good time for astronomy, really. It has. We've both been doing a, a bit of imaging of Jupiter, but you've been doing a lot more than I have, that's for sure. And you've been producing some images that have been up on the Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. I've been um, trying new techniques and uh, and trying to make movies out of still images that have mm-hmm. been stacked up. But it's it is pretty time consuming. It's it's pretty time consuming. But then again, you know that's that's astronomy for you, time consuming yeah. hobby. Yeah. So yeah, we've had a few clear nights, and I mean, apart from Jupiter, there's been some great deep sky objects. Winter is always a fantastic mm. time for the deep sky. We've got Orion and Taurus just way up there. Jupiter's, of course, up in Taurus, sharing the sky with the Pleiades and the Hyades clusters. And then Orion, of course, with the Great Orion Nebula, which is a fantastic sight because in a telescope it shows lots of structure. In binoculars it shows a little bit of structure, albeit at very low power. But it is, of course, visible to the naked eye as a faint smudge. And that's a real star-forming region where stars are being born. Mm. And as we discussed at the end of last year, and has now been picked up on by the mainstream astronomy press, I note sometime after we broke the story. Oh, really? Um, there may well be a black hole mm. at the centre of the uh, Orion Nebula cluster, where the trapezium is located. But in any event, we've got a better understanding now, or we think we have from the modelling of how uh, how those clusters came to be. Um, but one other thing to mention about the Orion Nebula is that it doesn't matter whether you've got light polluted skies or really clear skies. It's one of those objects, one of the few nebulas out there where you really do get a really good view of it, regardless of how poor your skies are. Exactly. The last um, really fantastic night I had was one that we shared over in Regent's Park in mm-hmm. London, where we went to join the Baker Street Irregular Astronomers. And um, a very good friend of mine had his 60 millimeter telescope set up, which I'm sure you can appreciate. It's a very modest aperture mm. for a telescope, pointed at the Orion Nebula at about 30 power, and the view was really quite remarkable. And this was unfiltered through the um, through the gloomy orange skies in London. Yep. But actually, it was a very, very, very clear night. It was misty, but it was, it was a, a really a good night. clear night. Yeah. Um, the mist was very low, and there was there was no mist overhead. But that was excellent. Awesome. <laughs> But anyway, as for black holes in the Orion Nebula cluster, that's old news. We need to talk about some new news. And before Ralph goes on his massive awesome astronomy news bender, I'm going to squeeze in a little bit of cosmology, which is kind of funny, because cosmology is not little at all. It's actually the study of the large-scale structure of the universe. And if you think galaxies are big, well, they're not exactly a large-scale structure. No, we're talking about... Uh, clusters of galaxies or larger structures still. In fact, in this story, we're talking about what may well be the largest structure in the entire universe. And it's actually a cluster or a group of quasars. And quasars have been known to group up for some time. And and the term LQG, large quasar group, has materialized in the community over time. But recently, a study was led by, um, by University of Central Lancashire, um, and it was actually led by their Jeremiah Horrocks Institute, Dr. Roger Clowes, one of the senior scientists working on the project. And they discovered an LQG which could be 4 billion light years long. 4 billion? 4 billion light years long. Um, so that's a pretty big structure. I mean, they, they regard this to be a structure because it's a, it's a gigantic gravitationally bound group of quasars which are all effectively traveling together. Now, it has this sort of quite typical uh, width waves dimension of 500 megaparsecs. That's typical for an LQG. 500 megaparsecs, of course, 
uh, is something like 1.6 to 1.8 billion light years. Um, but it's unusually long. It's unusually elongated to 1200 megaparsecs, which would put it at 4 billion light years long. Whereas most LQGs have a sort of dimension across from any axis of around 500 megaparsecs. So it's a huge object. And these LQGs, well, they are quite controversial because for a long time they've challenged the notion that astrophysicists shouldn't actually be able to find any structure larger than around 350 to 400 megaparsecs in size. So these LQGs have always been challenging this um, this uh, assumption. The assumption comes from the cosmological principle which is the effectively the statement that uh, on large scales the universe looks much the same in all directions. Wherever you plonk yourself in the universe, you should be able to look at the sky and see much the same thing mm -hmm. in terms of the overall average density. And you know, large scales are approximately 70 megaparsecs or so, so you, you have to average over quite a large area for that to work. And a lot of studies have shown that generally we think the cosmological principle holds, but these objects do challenge it. And the cosmological principle is, of course, foundational to um, our uh, support for things like the Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. uh, the cosmological principle is an extension of the Copernican principle, and it's the same principle that Albert Einstein based his work on, um, which, of course, the whole of the Big Bang Theory is based on. So, so much of cosmology is based on it. Huge amount. And so a lot of what we believe we understand about the large-scale structure of the universe hinges on whether or not uh, these large structures actually have any place in the universe uh, that operates under the cosmological principle, and we've seen so, several attacks on it. So can we say here then, Tom, that what one of these principles is right, that if this news story is right, then mm. there's a problem with the cosmological principle and vice versa? It's hard to say. There's the scientists who are announcing it are very excited that it challenges the cosmological principle, because, of course, it's a great discovery. Anything that challenges what we already know mm. is really exciting for scientists. At the same time, um, we've had large-scale structures uh, for a long time, you know, we've, we've understood about structures of this size for a long time, and no one that generally feels as a consensus that the cosmological principle is under threat from these structures. Yeah. It seems that given the age of the universe, there are there are ways to accommodate certain lumpiness in the universe's structure, certain in, in homogeneities in the structure of the universe, because the cosmological principle is a is a broad description of a system, but the universe, of course, is a real system, not an ideal system, and so there is some reason for this you know there's some possibility that this could this could come about uh in a universe which is subject to that principle mm -hmm. but um because the cosmological principle has been so widely accepted you know since the team of einstein uh this uh the team from the university of central lancashire are going to look for other cases to try and reinforce the idea that perhaps um the principle is wrong and if they can find more of course this might eventually lead to cast doubt over the cosmological principle we shall see but it's been around for a long time, and um, it's based on, you know, quite a, a humble assumption that we are not at any sort of special location. Indeed, mm. there is no special location mm. in the universe. But at the same time, it's led to all the, the weirdest statements about cosmology. You know, the Big Bang teaches us that, that there is no center to the universe. And in fact, space, rather than expanding from some point, it just expands everywhere all at the same time. And this is an unusual statement, but this holds true for a huge number of other observations, a, a massive number of observations since the 70s, when this theory really started to gain ground. Uh, so, of course, we can't just say that one uh, unusual um, observation or even a series of unusual observations, a small number of them, is a, is a kind of magic bullet mm. to demolishing what we already know. It may well be that there is a, a way to accommodate it uh, with what we already know, or it may be that it, it enhances the description of the universe as far as we're concerned. Mm. But we always like a discrepancy anyway. Absolutely, yeah. We like a discrepancy. We love to see something we weren't expecting. It's great. It means that um, you know, science is going to keep moving on. Yep. And there's, there's, there's science to be done for cosmologists out there. Um, now, from the, the largest structures in the universe to some of the smallest structural mm. objects floating around in space, asteroids uh, and the slightly larger cousins, the protoplanets, you've got some news about those. Yeah, that's right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about planet formation and then bring in some news that's come from the uh, NASA's Dawn spacecraft, because as far as we know, we only have one example still in existence of a planet whose growth was stunted in its very early phase. So there's only mm -hmm. one body in the solar system we can examine, and that's the asteroid Vesta. Mm -hmm. And as luck would have it, 
we're starting to learn a lot more about this type of planetoid because of NASA's Dawn spacecraft, which spent nearly 14 months in orbit around Vesta before leaving for the dwarf planet Ceres in September of just last year. Mm -hmm. And scientists are now busy pouring through the masses of data, as you'd expect, that's been collected by Dawn, and a few announcements have already been made about this, well, pretty historically and geologically fascinating object, Mm -hmm. and we can expect a barrage of information over the next few years about this. Mm -hmm. And... um, just want to say as an aside that um, we got a tweet to the um, Awesome Astronomy HQ saying that uh, NASA's Dawn spacecraft's going to be listening in. Now, I assume that's the people behind the mission, but it'd be, it's nice to think that the Dawn spacecraft's actually listening in themselves. Yeah, I think, well, NASA makes some very intelligent robots hmm. capable of listening to a podcast. Um, so I would like to think that is the spacecraft itself. We'll say it is. Yeah, and Dawn, if that is your real name, very popular name among our friends over in uh, in England on Earth. Um, but not so popular here in Cydonia. Uh, Tom and Ralph, I think, are the most popular names yes. currently. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Dawn, if that is your real name, thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. And we wish you a very safe trip to Ceres, which, although Ralph stated earlier was a dwarf planet, I'm absolutely adamant it's going to be reclassified as an asteroid <laughs> you when you get is? close enough <laughs> and see how how uh, how lumpy it is. We'll you think it's going to be lumpy? I think it's going to be. Uh, it's going to have that hydrostatic equilibrium. I don't know. I think it's going to be on the line. I think it's going to teach us new things about hydrostatic oh, uh, equilibrium. Yeah. I think we can both agree on that. Even those blurry, and I say blurry with the greatest respect, Hubble images. Mm. I think the surface of uh of series can be readily seen to be not quite so smooth as um, perhaps we thought but series of course has been a planet it's been an asteroid and it's been a dwarf planet uh, series was a planet yeah it used to be so um you can't really complain at this stage it's been no, everything it's been no, around but we'll know in february 2015 2015 that's when dawn's due to arrive yeah. and there can be no doubt about the um about Vesta, because that's just a 320 mile wide body. Um, actually, actually, it's correctly named for Vesta because it was the fourth asteroid to be discovered. That's right. Um, and this is an asteroid that lives in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and it sits between two and two and a half times further from the Sun than the Earth. And this is, as you were saying a minute ago, Tom, this is a huge distance to try and get a good understanding of an object, especially when it's so small. Mm. Um, before the arrival of Dawn in July 2011, the best images we had were the very fuzzy. Hubble Space Telescope images like with Ceres. Mm -hmm. And these suggested that on Vesta, there was a giant crater at the asteroid South Pole, but we could also spectroscopically analyse the asteroid remotely to give us an indication of its surface composition. And luckily, around about 5% of all meteorites that make their way to Earth show a similar spectroscopic profile to Vesta, which gives us confidence that they are fragments of this protoplanet and probably ejected by the impact that caused the giant crater that I mentioned a moment ago. Now, I've already called Vesta an asteroid, a protoplanet, a planetoid, and that's because it's thought that it exists as an asteroid of planetoid or minor planet proportions. That is, it's a big orbiting body, but without sufficient mass to make it round enough, and that's a term that I mentioned earlier called hydrostatic equilibrium, Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have that hydrostatic equilibrium to fall into the International Astronomical Union's definition of a dwarf planet. And of course, it's certainly not cleared out its orbit either. Even though, just like uh, Pallas, Juno and uh, Ceres, Mm -hmm. Vesta was actually classified as a planet for over 50 years. Yes, all the discoveries of asteroids back in the 1800s were first first named as planets, yeah. Named as planets, yeah. Yeah. And and this is great, actually, because now we can see eight planets in our solar system that show just how these protoplanets that successfully vacuumed up all the gas and dust at the beginning of the solar system can end up. We also see fragments of debris that remain intact and weren't glommed onto the growing planetoids within the asteroid belt. Some of these are are called planetesimals, the the smallest objects that have gravitationally bound before they become planetoids or Mm -hmm. dwarf planets. But in the case of Ceres and Vesta in particular... We have a pristine historical timeline of an early planetary evolution because their growth was stunted, probably because of the gravitational influence of Jupiter either dominating the dinner table or causing an unstable orbital perturbation that deprived its smaller siblings of the opportunity to grow. Now, if we take all the mass of the asteroid belt and combine it into one object, it would still be less than 10 times smaller than the Earth's moon, and almost half of that mass exists in Ceres and Vesta alone. In fact, the dawn images actually show that Vesta looks very much like a small moon with meteorite battered craters and mountains, but you do get an idea of why these bodies are just so exciting to explore in terms of the planetary evolution knowledge they hold as relics of the early solar system. So, what have we learned from the half billion dollar mission to Vesta so far? Well, Dawn has precisely determined its mass at 262 million billion tons, showing Earth-based estimates were only out by about 1%, which isn't too bad. Crikey, that's good. Very good. 
It showed Vesta as no moons of its own. That wasn't known beforehand. It was thought that there could be lots of orbiting debris around Vesta itself. Mm -hmm. And the giant crater at the South Pole has a central peak, like many on the moon, confirming a giant impact that would have caused it and spewed around about 1% of its mass into space, some of which has found its way to Earth for analysis, luckily. Now, it's also discovered hydrated and carbon-rich minerals on the surface caused by multiple forces. Now, some of these regions contained hydroxyl, which is the substructure of the water molecule that were formed by Vesta itself, while other regions' deposits were the result of carbon and hydroxyl-rich dust and rocks that rained down on Vesta and has been raining down there since the more turbulent early days of the solar system. But most striking of all is the composition, which we now know is decidedly differentiated like Earth's. That means that it has a separate core, mantle and crust, but in Vesta's case, it's got a much larger iron core relative to its size. And for an asteroid, that's quite a surprise, but it is necessary for the huge trough that's bigger, wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon that encircles Vesta to have formed. Dwarf planet Ceres, on the other hand, is thought to be an icy rather than a rocky world, and much more primitive than Vesta, geologically, but while we'll have to wait two more years for dawn to reach the dwarf planet, we can look forward to much more news about Vesta that will shed much more light on planetary formation during this early time in the solar system, and way to go dawn. And way to go dawn indeed. Very, very cool. So, that's kind of an interesting observation. So Ceres, although it's the bigger object of the two, yeah. and whilst both of these are rather like fossils, like mm. a fossil record yeah. for the solar system, Ceres is considered to be geologically more primitive than yes. Vesta. Yes, despite its larger size. Yeah, and thought to be mainly composed of ice. Mm. Um, and the really interesting thing is that that really large iron core that's within uh, Vesta makes you think that this was a good candidate mm. for being a planet. So, you know, Jupiter's got a lot to answer there for, for stripping it of what it can feed on to grow. Yeah, of course, Mercury also has an oversized iron mm. core for its size, which leads many scientists to, to postulate that perhaps it was struck by an impactor um, in the early days, which stripped away most of its uh, most of its outer layers of the planet, leaving it with this, in terms of proportions, larger iron core than we would expect for a mm. planet of its type. So perhaps Vesta has undergone something similar. Yeah. Perhaps Vesta was a larger body. Yeah. Of course, we do have evidence that it's suffered huge impacts in its mm. past. Yeah. Yeah, one catastrophic one. Mm. But also I've heard a theory that Mercury might also have been a gas giant planet that was orbiting and lost its atmosphere completely. But, um, you know, when we see other exoplanets and we see just how many of these gas giants there are orbiting the sun really close in. But the problem really with close. that theory is that it would mm. have, to have to have migrated in. And yet you've got all these planets that are in the way of its migration path. So, you know, there's a lot more we still need to know about the way that solar systems form. Yeah. Well, if I was a gas giant planet, um, I'd migrate to the inner solar system if it meant getting away from Jupiter. Um, and where it's warmer as well. Exactly. Mm. I'm just joking. I love Jupiter. We all love Jupiter. Jupiter's still my friend. Until it gets too close. Until it gets, yeah, when Jupiter gets too close, then you're in trouble. Awesome. Well, that's the news for this first episode of 2013. And now over to you, Tom, so you can tell us about what we can look forward to in the solar system in 2013. Yeah, the solar system in 2013 throws up some mixed fortunes, actually. It's a bit of an unusual time to be observing from the Earth, and one of the most unusual things probably is that Mars and Jupiter, between them, neither will come to opposition in mm. 2013 at all. We've seen the opposition of Jupiter at the end of last year, uh, around the beginning of December, and we'll see the opposition of Mars in 2014. When the Curiosity mission was first launched, many of us believed that its mission lifetime would be um, about two years long, and that would mean that by the time that Mars came back around for observers on the Earth, Curiosity would be approaching the end of its mission. And of course, I think either way, whether Curiosity's mission was to continue or whether it was to be you know, cut off at the end of two years, Mars will be phenomenally interesting to observers and newcomers alike yeah. uh, in 2014 yeah. when it comes back round because there's just so much n more news. Mm. And especially looking forward to what more news is probably on the horizon. Yeah, and by the sounds of it, that's quite a lot more news because, of course, um, the Curiosity mission has been extended indefinitely, yes. which is fantastic, absolutely fantastic because it's such a superb mission. So, Mars will be back in 2014. Jupiter, still very good at the moment, still going to be good throughout January, but it will begin to leave us. But one thing that is notable about Jupiter is it's extremely high up, and it will actually be very high up in 2014, so high up that uh, in March of 2014 there will be a National Astronomy Week dedicated to the planet Jupiter, observations wow. of the planet Jupiter. So that's something to look forward to. But we're talking about 2013. Another planet that we're going to ignore is Venus. 
Of course, we will be talking about Venus later in the year, but Venus is quite low throughout 2013. It's not a great year to be observing that planet, but one planet that, that is giving quite a favourable um, apparition towards the begin, sort of around the beginning of the year is Mercury. Mercury will be an evening object at its greatest eastern elongation uh, on the 16th of February, and on that date it will reach about 15 degrees above the horizon after sunset, um, with a disk of about 7.2 arc seconds. So that's coming on for about three times the size of Neptune. Yeah. So it's not too bad. Mars can show detail under 7.2 arc seconds. So um, I would think that Mercury would be quite interesting. It will be 50% illuminated, so it will be a perfect half planet to mm. observe around that time. And it's reaching a magnitude of minus 0.4, and it will be very close to the star Phi Aquarii in Aquarius. So that's one to look out for on the 16th of February. But probably the star of 2013, planetary-wise, is going to be Saturn, the ring world, which is back with us um, this month, in fact. Uh, it's a morning object right now. It will be rising at 1 a.m. Uh, by the end of January, and the opposition of Saturn will take place in April. And at that point, Saturn will be roughly 43, 44 arc seconds in diameter if you include the rings. So not too dissimilar from the size that it appeared last year. And even though it's not at its absolute best opposition this year, and even though the rings are still not at the, perhaps their best inclination, Saturn was really good last year uh, when it was around. Got some fantastic views. Yeah, and Saturn's always spectacular, even if it's not a good opposition. It just looks so beautiful as the only planet that you can see the rings around. Yeah, exactly. And and Saturn's great for pulling people into the hobby. So mm. just remember, when you're recruiting new astronomers this year, April is going to be a very good time to do it. And of course, that also puts Saturn in the sky during the May Astro Camp in Wales, which we'll be attending. Because yeah. we'll be there around the beginning of May. Saturn will still be with us. It'll be uh, really the best planet to observe at that event when Jupiter's so low after sunset. Yeah, and that's a really good time of year because um, around April time and also at the beginning of the May when we've got uh, Astro Camp going ahead, we've got Saturn that's going to be nice and high in the sky. Yep. There's Jupiter early on. You've got the Eta Aquarius meteor shower yep. and also possibility of still seeing Comet Panstars. That's right. And Panstars is, of course, the warm-up act for mm. comets in 2013. Panstars is going to be great in March and, like you say, will probably still be um, within reach around that time time of the Astro Camp in early May. And um, actually, one of the interesting thing that I learned about Panstars uh, since the last time we recorded was that we're expecting a close approach with the Andromeda Galaxy. Perspective-wise, of course, we're not expecting Panstars to shoot two and a half million light years away and come back, but um, we're expecting a close ap approach at the end of March. And that's quite interesting, to have a galaxy and a, a comet together, both quite diffuse objects, one extremely close um, cosmically speaking, and one extremely far mm -hmm. away. Um, I'm certainly going to be scanning that field, that area of sky, at very low power, just to see how that looks and whether I can distinguish the two. But of course, Panstars is not the biggie. We've got two more comets, and one of them might be the comet of our age. We're not exactly sure, and we're not going to commit just yet, but we are very excited about Comet Eisen, which is predicted to be absolutely spectacular if, if predictions come true, Comet Eisen will be a fabulous naked eye object after sunset uh, towards the end of the year. Eisen's perihelion takes place in November, so at that point it will come very, very close to the sun um, and will not be visible. But towards the end of October, that's going to be an excellent time to be looking for it. It actually also, around the beginning of September, comes very close to the Beehive Cluster in Cancer. So that should be quite a nice opportunity as well to do a bit of uh, observing of a cluster and a comet in the same field. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to Eisen this year. We're going to see the news unfold um, as we get better and better information about yeah. Eisen's position throughout the throughout the end of the year and indeed um, the composition of the, of the comet and how we expect it to break up because that's very important as well. Yeah. So we'll just keep you informed every month here yeah. on Awesome Astronomy. And I would like to add there, Tom, that I've had quite a few questions coming in on Twitter about uh, Comet Eisen with a few people being concerned about how dangerous it might be. So I just want to add in there that it's not going to explode. It's not going to hit Earth. It won't be dangerous in any way, but it might well be spectacular to look at. Yeah, it might blow your mind, but that's about uh, yeah. all the danger it poses to And we'll you, take so. that. Yeah, we'll take that, yeah. So don't worry about Comet Eisen. It's going to be great. But just before Comet Eisen hits, in September, there will be a very good opportunity to observe Comet Enka. I didn't want to leave Enka out because um, that's been a very, very good periodic comet for observers. And um, as I say, very good in September, so a nice little warm-up act there to get us all in the mood for Eisen. That will also, we expect, become a naked eye object during its uh, approach. So we'll keep you informed about that one too. 
As for meteors, well, we've already mentioned the Eater Aquariids around the beginning of May. Um, obviously there are meteor showers throughout the year and the smaller ones don't tend to get picked up on and the larger ones are the ones everyone's concerned with. We'll be keeping you informed, you know, as the meteors come. But I just wanted to mention that this year will be a fantastic year to observe the Perseids in August because new moon takes place at the beginning of the month. So the moon will be waxing on towards the, the time that we expect the Perseids uh, peak, which is around the 12th to 13th of August every year. But of course the moon will be setting well before midnight on the night of the Perseids when the radiance is up nice and high. So that will be an excellent time to observe that. And um, also because the moon is waxing and isn't too bright, we can also watch the rise of the Perseids uh, as they as the numbers start to go up. Because the Perseids can have um, quite a broad, a good broad peak, kind of sort of week, maybe even 10 day long peak where rates are very, very good rather than some showers which tend to be quite a, kind of quiet and then have mm. a sort of one day peak. Yeah. And if it's cloudy, you miss it. The great thing about the Perseids is you can go out several nights before and after and get almost as good an experience as you can get on the night of the peak. So there should be something for everyone with uh, whatever the weather at that sort of time. So that's a great one to look out for. Well, this was just a quick look ahead at the solar system in 2013. We'll have a detailed analysis of, uh, of the months as they go by. But for now... Keep watching Jupiter and uh, get ready to watch Saturn. Awesome. Well, those are the highlights of the solar system in 2013. We've talked about the solar system's fossil record. We've talked about what you can see in the next month. Um, but now we're going to talk about something that you might be able to see in the near or distant future in the solar system. Hopefully in the near future. Mm. Ralph, you've been talking to a very interesting fellow about the possibility of life in the solar system. That's right. Dr. Lewis Dartnell is an astrobiologist at University College London's Centre for Planetary Sciences. His primary research focuses on the possibility of microbial life surviving in the surface dust of Mars. In addition to his many TV appearances and science newspaper articles, Lewis is a writer of astronomy books including Life in the Universe, A Beginner's Guide, and just last year an illustrated children's book, His Tourist's Guide to the Solar System and Beyond. Welcome to Awesome Astronomy, Lewis. <laughs> Hi, Ralph. Thank you for having me. Well, most of our listeners will probably be familiar with the specific branches of astronomy and biology. Is astrobiology simply putting the two disciplines together, or to put it another simpler way, I guess, <laughs> what is astrobiology? You know, I, I think I think you're, you're kind of right there. It's, it's it's called an interdisciplinary subject, and it's pretty much the I don't know the, the kind of Venn diagram overlap between biology and understanding the the origins and extent of life on Earth. Mm -hmm as well as astronomy and finding planets orbiting other stars in the night sky and geology and trying to find evidence for the earliest life on on our planet and the most ancient rocks um, on the surface um, as well as kind of biochemistry and more kind of chemical studies into, into the real kind of nitty-gritty of, of what life actually is so it's it's this kind of mix this fusion of lots of different sciences all coming together and different scientists with different language and different background knowledge all starting to help each other out to, to answer this question about astrobiology and the possibility of life beyond Earth. So it sounds like there can be no one perfect astrobiologist because you need so many disciplines involved in it. Yeah, you, you kind of need to be a, a jack of all trades whilst trying to be a, a master of all, <laughs> um, which is tricky. You'll, you'll go to a, a science conference and in the same session of the conference have completely different lectures on completely different topics and it you often feel like you're struggling to kind of keep up and, and, and understand such a breadth of, of stuff. Um, but on the other hand, that, that's what keeps it fresh and exciting, that you're, you're constantly learning new things and not kind of settling down into too much of a comfort zone. Yeah, and uh, I think that one of the areas that's so fascinating to people is the um, is this actual uh, look for life elsewhere in the solar system or, yeah. or, or, or looking at the science of life that could survive elsewhere in the solar system and the range of habitats that it could possibly form in. So although life hasn't been detected elsewhere in the universe, can I ask you about um, the suitable bodies in our solar system in turn and discuss their potential for life, starting with, say, Mars? Yeah, so Mars is the place that I focus on um, as our kind of next door neighbor planet it's, mm -hmm. it's the closest planet to earth with, with any possibility for life and so it's also the places that's easiest for us to go to with our robotic probes to to explore it um and the reason that we think mars is is at least a, a potential habitat or abode for life or primitive bacterial life is that a long time ago billions of years ago when life was getting started here on earth mars seems to be a, a reasonably earth-like place itself mm -hmm. with with water flowing across its surface and a thicker insulating atmosphere and organic molecules so that the building blocks of all life as we know it would have been 
delivered to the surface of Mars aboard meteorites and comets in the same way they were onto the surface of the Earth and possibly gave us a kickstart here. So Mars seems to kind of tick all the right you know, boxes for, for planetary habitability and mm-hmm. chances for, for life to get started there. How does the recent NASA release, the news release recently about Mars having non-lethal radiation, uh, levels of radiation affect the chance of detecting life on Mars? Presumably that must make it easier as well, does it? Or more likely? That, that's in fact exactly what my research focuses on, is the cosmic radiation bombarding down the surface of Mars because the red planet has no protection from a magnetic field or a thick atmosphere like we do here on Earth. And th- there's, there's kind of two questions going on. There's, is the radiation on Mars too hazardous that it would start preventing or making us seriously reconsider sending human astronauts to Mars? Mm-hmm. And the data coming back from um, Curiosity and the radiation detector on that rover is that, well, probably not. I mean, it, it's something you want to consider carefully but it's certainly not a showstopper. But if you're talking about bacterial life on Mars that might be held dormant or kind of frozen in the freezing temperatures on Mars for long periods, then that radiation, the the kind of effects of that radiation can build up over time. And so that still might be a a really big issue for life in the top meter or two of the Martian surface, which unfortunately is the only bit we're gonna have access to for the foreseeable future with drills on, on the end of a robot. So it's, it, it, the, the radiation on Mars is a very complex issue. Um, and presumably um, the lower the doses of radiation means that if there were any microbial life on Mars, then it could survive past its habitable phase longer. Is that, is, is that the case? Yeah, exactly. You, you want to know how long something can remain dormant on Mars before it's essentially nuked to death, before the radiation and the damage from that radiation builds up to such level that even if that cell were to thaw out, wake from its sleep, like, like you know, kind of sleeping beauty, and then start trying to repair itself, and if it uses DNA trying to repair the damage to its genome and its DNA, then if it's been dormant for too long, the radiation damage would accumulate to such an extent that it wouldn't be able to repair and, and, and would essentially be dead. It would have been sterilized in its sleep. Um, and so that's one of the main concerns or questions about microbial life surviving in the very top uh, sand or dirt of Mars. And um, you mentioned earlier that Mars was probably quite Earth-like with oceans and an atmosphere, yeah. uh, or a thicker atmosphere than it currently has. Do we have any idea of how long it remained in that state for? It's really hard to tell. You, you obviously can't tell directly because we can't build a time machine to go back. So you have to use indirect methods. You have to use evidence to infer something else. Mm-hmm. And there was, um, there's been some really nice studies looking at things like um, meteorites that have fallen down onto Mars and yet not shattered or fragmented when they hit the ground. So they must have been slowed and cushioned to a great extent. Mm-hmm. And so the atmosphere must be much thicker when that meteorite arrived. So the, the Mars exploration rovers, MERS, Spirit and Opportunity, um, one of them found an eye meteorite on the surface that, that must have landed during a period of a thicker atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But, but it's very hard for us to tell um, when when that atmosphere started escaping away into space and and what time course that happened over, how quickly it happened. And these are are exactly the kind of questions that we're trying to answer now with Curiosity and then ExoMars, which will be the next rover um, that the European Space Agency, ESA, will be launching. Yeah, and next year, of course, we've got the MAVEN spacecraft that's launching to analyse the Martian atmosphere. Does does this have the potential for any astrobiological finds? A a whole lot of astrobiology is about looking for biosignatures, looking for signs of life, which for Mars are probably going to be very subtle and difficult to detect. And so you want to put rovers down to the ground with very sensitive chemical detection kits that can sniff out even trace amounts of organic molecules, Mm -hmm. amino acids or the building blocks of DNA in in the soil. But if there's life deep underground in Mars, it might reveal itself um, by another means. And one of the tantalizing hints that we've had so far, but, but is still being heavily debated, is the presence of, of methane mm-hmm. in the atmosphere, because virtually all of the methane in the Earth's atmosphere is biogenic. It was put there by life, by you know, crudely by cows farting, <laughs> or, or at least by bacteria in the guts of cows releasing methane as a, as a byproduct in the same way that we kind of breathe out carbon dioxide as humans. And I understand it degrades over time as well, doesn't it? So it needs to keep being replenished. Exactly. That's so that's why it's it's double exciting. They're not only could it potentially be a biosignature, but it would be a signature of life very, very recent, if not even 
current still alive today and an active underground because, because the methane gets destroyed in the Martian atmosphere over only a few hundred years. And, and what's the current thinking at the moment? Is it still believed that that is more likely to be a geological activity or microbial presence? <laughs> well, actually, it's the, the heavy debate is revolving around whether it exists there at all. Oh, right. Because it's it, it's it's trace amounts, so it's right on the detection limit of, of the instruments we're trying to use to, to see if methane's there or not, which is why um, future missions like um, the ExoMars Trace Gas analyzer um are going to be so important to see if the methane's there at all and try to localize where it's coming from and um, because it's right in the detection limit at the moment so we're not entirely sure if it, if it has really been discovered you have to use certain assumptions and depending on how certain those assumptions are we, we could be wrong about it mm -hmm. and so what would you like to see in order to definitively answer the question about life on mars what kind of robot assuming that humans couldn't go there well curiosity was never designed to find unambiguous signs of life itself. The, the current NASA rover is much more about telling us the story about how habitable Mars was, mm -hmm. so how warm it's been in the past, how long liquid water has been flowing across its surface, what kind of environmental conditions there might have been for life to got started under. Whereas ExoMars, which is the, the ESA mission I mentioned already that I'm working on, is a life detection mission. It is, its sole purpose, specific purpose, is to look for signs of life. So you think ExoMars will give us a definitive yes or no? You can't say stuff like that. If it, it's there and we're looking in the right place and looking in the right way, there's every hope that, that ExoMars might find something. But, you know, that the whole planet is a big place and we just trying to make our best guess about where to look and how to look for it. Because at the end of the day, you're, you're trying to recognize something that is by definition alien that, that might be very different from us. So you're trying to work out how to find and recognize something that might be very much unlike us, might be very dissimilar. So it's hard, but I mean, again, that's what makes it so challenging and exciting. And it's trying to design these instruments to be as broad as possible without trying to make too many assumptions and, and blink yourself, but also have a good chance of finding something. Yeah, and quite often the serendipitous discoveries are just as exciting as the, the answers we, we're looking for, or, the, or rather the questions we're looking for answers for. Exactly, which is what Spirit and Opportunity have found us as well, uh, so the things they stumbled across that we weren't expecting to find. Okay, so moving out to Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa in particular all have got deep oceans with the potential for life. If we focus on Europa, what kind of life forms could we hope to find there? Well, the problem with Europa is that although it's, as far as we can tell, it's got a, a deep ocean of liquid water. So in, in fact, it might offer a, a better hope for life today than even Mars, because Mars is very dry on its surface now. But the problem with Europa is that that ocean would be sealed in. It, it's got this um, global ice shell covering it. And so there'd be limited interaction from the deep ocean underneath and the surface and, and the uh, energy input from the sun, from sunlight and, and radiation and things. So it might be that the kind of sealed, contained environment of Europa doesn't have enough kind of energy flowing through it, doesn't have enough nutrients being delivered to the ocean to support a big eco ecosystem that it might be you know might be kind of cut off too much to preclude life and and this is why we dearly want to go back to europa and, and hopefully first with a an orbiter mission to try and get a, a good handle on how thick the ice is in the first place because again there's an enormous amount of debate about whether the european ice shell is thin and so only a couple of kilometers deep of ice before you get down to the water or whether it's thick and then perhaps tens, if not towards 100 kilometers thick, mm -hmm. because that makes a very, very big difference. That's a huge engineering problem if it's that thick. Exactly. So a huge engineering problem to, to drill or melt your way down into the ocean. But it, it, it's a much more of an issue for life in the ocean as well. If you've got a thicker ice shell, because then you basically cut off any hope of, of communication from the surface down into, into, the, into the ocean, of, of getting nutrients from the surface down into the ocean. And do we think that NASA's Juno or ESA's JUICE missions will be able to give us this um, answer as to how thick the ice is on Europa? JUICE, Juice is a very exciting mission. It's not going to be dedicated to Europa. and We'll only get a few flybys. But the, the last time we visited the Jovian system and dropped into orbit around Jupiter rather than just passing by like Cassini did, it was um, the Galileo mission. And that was quite a while ago. And we didn't get, we didn't get to map the whole of Europa to the kind of resolution to the, you know, high quality photographs that you would have liked and so by going back and mapping Europa much better and taking a look at the, the features on its surface and trying to interpret them to work at how thick the ice might be then that's what juice could potentially offer us and then next mission after that maybe fingers crossed depending on what juice tells us 
might be a lander mission on Europa, and there might be some kind of drill or, or probe that we might try and send down through the ice. But I mean, that all depends on what we find out from from subsequent missions, missions between now and then. And that sounds incredibly exciting. Do we think that there could be something as exciting as um, complex life like fish down there, or, or we, is the best we can hope for something analogous to deep sea vents on Earth? Well, certainly for Mars, the only hope is for primitive bacterial microbial life forms. It hasn't been a stable environment for long enough for evolution to get beyond hardy bacteria, the kind of extremophiles we find on Earth. Mm -hmm. But depending on the environment in Europa's ocean, there might possibly be the chance for life to have got beyond single cell bacterial like life forms to perhaps more complex multicellular life. But it all comes down to how much energy can get flowing through the system. And, you know, this comes down to kind of ecology and how much energy is being input into to keep large organisms alive because large organisms need to eat lots of smaller organisms. So it's, it's all this kind of energy flowing through the food web. And most importantly, all complex life on Earth, all multicellular life like ourselves, but even down to kind of strands of fungus kind of molding your cheese in, in the fridge, we all rely entirely on oxygen. We, we have to react oxygen with the food molecules we get to extract as much energy from them as, as possible to, to drive the more complex life. And if you've got a sealed in ocean like Europa, it might be very, very difficult to get enough oxygen dissolved in that water to support more complex life. And then that's why the, the thickness of the ice shell is so important, because you can create oxygen on the surface from the radiation just by splitting apart the water. But you've got to get that oxygen then down into the ocean and dissolve in it. And we just don't know. We don't know what kind of rates there might be of, of oxygen being delivered. There's some calculations I've seen that suggest the, the, that the oxygenation of Europa's ocean might be even more than more than the, that of the Earth. It might be kind of super oxygenated. But, but again, we don't know till we go there. OK, so moving out to Saturn's largest moon, Titan, which is altogether different again, what, what could we hope to find there one day? Well, again, Titan is a, a, a tantalizing place. It's a very exciting place, but, but it's even more alien than, than Mars or, or Europa. Mm -hmm. And although we see a lot of active dynamic processes on Titan, we, we've seen river valleys carved down the highlands of Titan. We've seen lakes full of fluid. It, it's the only place beyond the Earth that we know about in, this, in, the, in the entire universe where you could go on a, on a yachting holiday. It, it's got lakes. It's got an atmosphere. But the, the fluid, that the wet stuff on Titan, isn't water. It's far too cold for that. It's liquid methane. And we don't know enough yet about what kind of chemistry you can get going on in liquid meth methane. Is it, is it even sensible to be talking about methane-based life rather than water-based life? Because certainly things like DNA, you cannot get them to dissolve in methane. It's not, it's not as, as a good a solvent as water is. So the, the jury is very much out about Titan. But it's exciting from a layman's perspective to hear scientists not completely ruling it out, just thinking that it's, uh, it's unlikely. But it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult call. You, you're always on this balance, particularly with the national biology, I think, of wanting to keep an open mind, not wanting to rule anything out until you know. And, and particularly with astrobiology, which is a very new science, that there is still an enormous amount of stuff just the basic knowledge we want to get you know, as to how feasible it might be to find life on other planets. Mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you don't want to be too open-ended and, and waste your time checking places which, which are less plausible than, than perhaps Mars or, you know, you want to kind of prioritise where you look. Yeah. And so looking further afield, we've got exoplanets being discovered in the hundreds now, yeah. like at least 581G and Kepler-22b that are thought to exist in habitable zones around their stars even. Yeah. So what can we learn about those worlds that help us determine if life could form there? Well, again, there's, there's, there's kind of different pathways to, to the knowledge, and pretty much all the information you get out of an exoplanet when you first discover it, when you first detect it, is either its mass or its radius, its size, depending on which technique you've used. Or if you're lucky... And if you can use two techniques on the same planet, you can divide one by the other and get the density of the world. So you can find out if it's a small, rocky planet or a big, gassy planet like Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And you can also do some basic mathematical calculations, some modeling, and work out what the temperature on the surface is likely to be. And this is why we talk about the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot or not too cold, but just right for liquid water and life on the planet. But ideally, what you want to be able to do is not just model or, or try to calculate the conditions on a planet, but actually look for evidence of life there, look for these biosignatures. And we, we hinted already at the possibility of atmospheric biosignatures on Mars, the traces amounts of, of methane in the Martian atmosphere. 
if we can use similar techniques, um, spectroscopy through a telescope, and if we can use these, these techniques on the atmosphere and the light coming through the atmosphere of an exoplanet, and we see that it's an oxygen rich air with perhaps things like methane mixed in, that would be by far the best evidence we could hope to gather in, you know, in centuries before actually going to this planet, that there might be life there. It would, it would be a kind of a smoking gun of, of life betraying its existence. And I understand the James Webb Space Telescope that's due to come online in around about 2018, if it doesn't slip any further, may have the potential for, for doing this spectroscopy. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how close these planets are. If we want to find an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of its star. And if we find enough candidates that kind of fit those criteria, then the James Webb Space Telescope would be able to do that kind of measurement, that kind of infrared spectroscopy. Um, but people are, are also proposing um, dedicated missions to do exactly that. And there's a mission called ECHO, or the Ex Exoplanet Characterization Observatory, um, which is being led by a scientist, um, Giovanna Tinetti, here at University College London, that, that is specifically designed to, to do that, to kind of read the chemistry of exoplanets' atmospheres and to look for biosignatures. Um, so fingers crossed that that one gets funded, um, and that will be launched by ESA sometime in the 2020s, I think, if, it, if it's selected. It's so exciting to see the the progression of um, science around exoplanets yeah. that, that just wasn't even a science 10, 15 exactly. years ago. Exactly. It blows ago. my mind. We didn't know of a single example of another solar system you know, 15, 16 years ago. And we now know over, over, over 800 exoplanets. It, you know, it's a science has really exploded in just the last couple of years. <laughs> And um, if we move uh, more towards, uh, I hesitate to use the word fringes, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we stray more from the mainstream, does life have to be carbon and water based? Um, thinking back to what you were saying about Titan. Well, yeah, this, this links nicely back to a point I was making earlier that on one hand, you want to be open minded and, and consider possibilities that are different to us. You're looking for aliens. You've got to think about alternatives to how we do it. But, but then again, you want to prioritise, you want to look at, for the best possible chance and, and not waste your time or money looking in places that are less likely. Mm -hmm. So from what we know of life on Earth, all life is water-based and all terrestrial life is, is organic. We're based on, on carbon chemistry. And actually, the, you might be able to reasonably consider alternatives to water. You might have something like ammonia, which is a similar solvent to water. It's also a polar solvent, where something like methane which the, the, the majority of the wet stuff on Titan is a non-polar solvent. It doesn't dissolve things the same way or as well as water does. So you might consider alternatives to, to water as the biosolvent. But when you start thinking about alternatives to carbon, it's just the basic element of life that for building up these frameworks of, of complex molecules like DNA to store information, that there isn't really anything that is a reasonable alternative to carbon. And even silicon which is the most carbon-like element in the periodic table. It sits just beneath in, in the next row down. It, it's just rubbish it's sticking together and building up these um, skeletons of, of, of great complex molecules like DNA or proteins, and, and silicon-based alternatives just fall apart. So it seems reasonable to, to look for organic life, but, but possibly keep our mind open for non-water life. And what about DNA itself? Could anything we can hypothesize allow life to flourish without that particular helical structure? Well, yeah, so all life on Earth uses DNA, but that, that doesn't mean there aren't alternatives that might not work just as well. It might be an example of a, a frozen accident in our evolution that once you hit on one solution to store information, it becomes too hard to change it later because you can't really change DNA without you know, killing yourself um, as a life form. Mm -hmm. But it might just be a kind of random occurrence that we settled upon DNA three and a half, almost four billion years ago on the young Earth. And maybe um, if there is Martian life, maybe it's settled on a different solution to store its DNA. So we might expect to find non-DNA-based life. And there's, there's been a series of really interesting experiments um, from a lab in Germany where they've been kind of tweaking the, the building blocks that you use to make DNA out of. So changing the sugar that's used in, out of ribose in the, in the deoxyribonucleic acid DNA um, or changing the letters of the, the genetic code. And it seems some changes you can make in it might still work as a, as a functioning information storage molecule. But if you start changing the sugar, and if you start using glucose instead of deoxyribose, for example, then you don't get this glorious kind of spiral structure. It's almost as if the sugar is too big and bulky for the DNA to kind of hold together properly. Mm. So you might get slight variations on DNA, or you might get a completely different molecule altogether. 
so I think if we move from the, the science to the psychology, why do you think astrobiology and the hunt for life elsewhere excites the public interest so much? I think it's I think it's just one of those questions that that, that everyone's thought of in the past and everyone's had a you know, a chat with their mates in the pub about, mm-hmm. you know, are we alone? Is there other stuff like us out there? Or you've you know, been on a camping trip and you've looked up and, and been surprised at just how many stars are out there when you're away from the city lights and you know, it set your mind wondering. I, I think it's just one of those universal questions uh, about are we alone it's very kind of like self-reflective isn't it to kind of look out and wonder if there's anything like you out there yeah it seems to be one of those questions that's just innate to humanity we have we we have to ask it don't we i think so i mean i don't want to get found about it all but but i think it is i think the question's about where did we come from what are the origins of of life on earth and linking from that into well did that happen elsewhere is is, is there other things out there Mm mm-hmm you, know, you don't have to be a scientist to ask those questions. I think you, most five-year-olds have probably thought about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, for, for adults and children wanting to learn more about astrobiology and the chances for life existing elsewhere, your books really are the perfect place to start. I would definitely say so. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us a little more about them? Um, yeah, so Life in the Universe, Beginner's Guide, is is, is written essentially just as that. It's, it's a pick off the shelf, not knowing anything about astrobiology or even you know, you don't have to be a scientist at all to pick it off the shelf and just start reading from chapter one, where we start talking about, you know, what this life thing is in the first place and what we mean by it and how it works and how we might start looking for it elsewhere. And then it, it kind of moves from between the different chapters, between all the different sciences that come together for astrobiology. So there's a bit of astronomy in there, there's a bit of geology in there, there's a bit of how the earth was formed um, and how life might have got started, what the current theories are for the origin of life on Earth. Um, and the second book that came out last year, as you mentioned, is a, a, an illustrated children's book with Dolan Kinsley. And then they do an, an incredible job with the kind of graphic layout and the, and the you know, the, the, the prettiness of the book and the gorgeous photographs of different things. And I just wrote the text explaining what it might be like in the future if you could walk into um, a, a travel agent on the high street and, and book a holiday with your family, with your mum and dad, mm-hmm. not to, you know, south of Spain, but to other planets and moons in the solar system. But what would be the the highlights of a holiday in space if you could go anywhere? And what would you want to make sure you don't miss? What would you want to make sure you get a photo of? Or what kind of souvenirs could you pick up? Um, And so, for example, I talk about going to Saturn. And something that I would absolutely love to be able to do is take a kind of spacewalk along the top of the the rings of Saturn. And I see that view of more of these kind of chunks of ice glittering back at you. Maybe grab a, a piece of ice, a piece of the rings of Saturn, and keep it in a special freezer cabinet to kind of bring home and you know put on the mantelpiece you could sometime in the future have a piece of the ring of saturn on your mantelpiece when you get back home so it's, it's kind of fun stuff talking about you know what, what kind of sights and sounds you might want to uh, explore if you could ever take a holiday in space and what could be more perfect than a, a holiday brochure for the whole universe yeah exactly so we, we kind of go a little bit beyond the solar system and look at um a star formation nebula because because that's basically the world's best lava lamp with all these beautiful colors and what it might be like to try and visit um, close to a black hole but obviously the, the risks and dangers of what that might be <laughs> well that was dr lewis dartnell giving us the inside track on astrobiology and researching life elsewhere in the universe thanks very much for taking the time to speak with us today lewis awesome cheers ralph thank you awesome. It's Q&A now. It's the last section of the show, but one of our favourite sections of the show, we get to answer your questions, and we love getting your questions in through a variety of means. We have a contact form on our website, which is awesomeastronomy.com. You can send them directly to us. We have our Twitter account, and we also have our Facebook page. And I'll just go back and say our Twitter account is at awesomeastropod, pod being short for podcast, which is what this is. So, I'm going to take a couple of questions this week and starting now with uh, one that's come in via our Twitter feed from Parton Bill. I assume your name's Bill. I'm going to call you Bill. As a newbie buying beginner level lenses, what noticeable benefit will I get from high level kit? This question is quite close to my heart because I work in the world of astronomy equipment and um, I find the equipment really fascinating. Technology has taken astronomy equipment so far just in the last few years alone. And when I started, when I got my first equipment coming on for 18 years ago now, uh, it was it was rubbish by today's standards. <laughs> it was absolutely rubbish. Nowadays, there's a huge spectrum of kit and you can go online and find what appear to be absolute bargains out there. And rest assured, most of them will work. You buy them, you pop them in, you'll be able to come to focus and you will get images that will, will amaze you, particularly if it's the first telescope you've ever owned or the first eyepiece you've ever owned 
But I have to say, there is a noticeable difference. And like with a lot of industries out there, you do get what you pay for with astronomy. And that's particularly true of niche industries where there are only a few manufacturers out there compared with really large industries. So what I generally recommend is discussing this with someone who's an expert in the field, talking to someone perhaps like a retailer. Um, and it's usually better to go to a retailer or an independent retailer than it is to try and get advice online on these matters. That's not to say that people give bad advice online. It's just that usually the commentators online have a limited experience or perhaps they're very much um, appreciate the kit that they own, but they can't really compare it. I do also recommend um, keeping in touch with the magazines. We've got some great magazines here in the UK and some great ones from the US as well that review new equipment as it comes around and just keeping uh, your ear to the ground on new equipment. And if you can take the opportunity to go and see some equipment, that can be really enlightening as well. Borrow equipment at your local society. Um, go to the retailers that actually uh, show the equipment. Those are the ones to support. And um, perhaps go along to the conferences held in the UK. The Astrofest, for example, taking place in London next month, which is a great opportunity to see all this stuff. I think you'll find that you do get quite a lot of benefit from high-level kit, but the crucial thing is to make sure that all your optics are in line. If you've got a good objective, you want to be matching that with good eyepieces. But if you've got a relatively moderate or poor objective, then good eyepieces are only going to take you so far. The tip is to talk to someone in person who knows what you've got and get them to advise you. But broadly speaking, yes, good kit, better images. So thank you very much for that uh, question, Bill. That's an excellent question and really got me thinking. Um, I hope you find what you're looking for. Um, sorry I can't give you a really specific answer, but we don't really want to endorse anything particular here just yet because no one's paying us to make this podcast. Wink, wink. You're going to cut that out, aren't you? Yeah. You are. You, I know you are. That's too cheesy. Now, question for Ralph. And this is a really popular question. Uh, this has been asked by a couple of people. and uh, Well, actually, this has been asked by a few people, but to name a couple... We've got uh, Damien Phillips in London, and we've also got the Horbury Astronomy Group in Wakefield asking this question. I don't know how many people are involved in the Horbury Astronomy Group, but I can only assume a huge number of people are shouting this question at the top of their lungs, mm -hmm. and that's how it made its way to us. And this question is something that was actually addressed recently on a popular TV show, and I know you've got a comment to make about that. And the question is, what are the brightness predictions if Betelgeuse goes supernova in our lifetime? Yes. Um, yeah, I want to address this because um, on this popular TV program, Stargazing Live, which was excellent again this year, um, they did say on there, they mentioned uh, Beetlejuice or Betelgeuse if you prefer, that it would be like having a second sun in the sky. And what I really want to do is address this because I don't want people getting expectations that would be dashed when something that would be not only once in a lifetime, but a huge thing to happen. I mean, actually witnessing a supernova at that distance or, or that proximity is going to be quite special without people overbuilding it so that expectations are dashed if it does go off in our lifetime. Right. So Betelgeuse is that bright red star in the left-hand shoulder of Orion and it's it lies somewhere around 650 light years away. So if it does go supernova, it's far too far away to cause any damage to anybody in this solar system. It is not going to be harmful. But it could go supernova any time in the next 100,000 years. It could even be up to a million years. So while that's on a cosmic scale, no time at all, you know, we would like it to go off in the next 10 or 20 years so we can be sure of seeing it. Yeah. Um, but what's happening is Betelgeuse is running out of fuel. It burns hydrogen as any other star does. And then when it starts to run out of hydrogen, if it's big enough, it'll start to burn up or, or fuse heavier elements. So at the moment, it's, it's fusing helium. But this is a lot harder for the star to do. So what Betelgeuse is trying to do, as all stars do, is counteract the forces of gravity trying to compress the star with the outward pressure of these nuclear explosions of the fusion process. But as it's starting to, to burn more helium, it's more of an uphill task for it, and it's more difficult to do, and eventually gravity is going to win over, as it does with all stars. And when this does happen, sometime in the next 100,000 years, there'll be an immense contraction of the star, and then one final outburst with a huge outpouring of energy, which is known as a supernova. Now, we can't predict how bright this is going to be, but the best scientific estimates put it somewhere between magnitude minus 8, which is kind of halfway between the brightness of Venus and the full moon, so incredibly bright and certainly visible in the daytime as a, as a small point of light, but nothing like as bright as a second sun. But the upper limit for this is around about magnitude minus 13, which will be brighter than the full moon, and actually at that brightness, if you've got the moon in the sky and Betelgeuse at the same time going supernova, it'll have this really eerie quality of everything casting two shadows at night time. Mm -hmm. And it'll certainly be bright enough to be able to read a book by, by the light of the supernova. 
and when it does go supernova it'll really rapidly brighten up and it'll this peak brightness will last for about two weeks before it gradually starts to dim over the next two weeks to a month so there'll be plenty of time for people to see it and after it has gone supernova although we're going to lose that wonderful star in the shoulder of Orion future astronomers are going to have a fantastic supernova remnant to view afterwards. Well, that's a hugely comprehensive answer, Ralph. And I, I, one thing that always strikes me about the Betelgeuse supernova speculation is that I think that uh, when it, it does ramp up, or perhaps when it does happen, or maybe when it's expected to be absolutely imminent, it's going to be a great test for astronomy journalists of the day. Maybe not astronomy journalists, but maybe <laughs> uh, other journalists who fancy an astronomy story to determine whether or not magnitude minus 13 is half or twice or otherwise <laughs> anywhere similar in brightness to the sun, which, of course, is minus 26. Yes. Um, and, of course, don't be tempted to think that minus 13 is half as bright as minus 26. Not even. We're dealing with a logarithmic scale on the magnitude system, so uh, it won't be anywhere near like having a second sun, no. But may well cast shadows. And the mainstream journalistic efforts are going to be very fun to read then. They are going to be fun to read, and maybe we'll have a section on the show picking them apart by that point. Yeah, and we'll certainly do that for Comet Eisen. Oh yeah, for Comet <laughs> Eisen, absolutely. Well, on to our last question now, and it comes in from Eric Ems via our Facebook group. And Eric asks, should the Sky at Night program continue without Sir Patrick Moore? This is um, obviously a, a sensitive question, mm. I think, for all fans of the Sky at Night. It's hard to imagine the Sky at Night as a program without Sir Patrick Moore, because save for one episode in 2004 when he had Salmonella, he didn't miss a single one since April of 1957. And that is a long time mm. to be presenting a show. So much so that, of course, Patrick Moore was synonymous with The Sky at Night and really was the show in many respects. But despite that, and despite the show's identity being driven very much by Sir Patrick, I think there's a strong feeling in the community which I share that The Sky at Night should continue. And The Sky at Night as a programme is, is absolutely pivotal. It's important that we have a monthly update about the night sky as part of the BBC's current affairs, as it was originally intended to be. You know, the Sky at Night is put together by a very, very hard-working team. I can say from experience, having seen from the other side of the camera what it's like making the Sky at Night, that it's um, it's no small task. It it looks like a, a show that operates on a fairly small budget, and for BBC programming compared to what we've seen on TV um, in January, it does operate on a small budget, and um, it takes a, a lot of effort from a from a from a small team of people to put together. But I just think they do such a fantastic job. And I do think that the fan base for the program has only grown over time. So it would be a shame um, for the Sky at Night to disappear completely. I would very much like to see it continue in whatever form, as long as the same people are making it, the people who care about the show. Yeah, I would echo your thoughts there as well. So thanks very much, um, Eric, for that question. Hopefully we've given a, a respectful answer. And um, I very much hope we will see the Sky at Night program continuing. And Chris Lintot has already confirmed that uh, the Sky at Night will continue. So that brings us to the end of the show, the end of the first show of 2013, the first of 12 full shows, if not more, to come this year. How exciting is that? Um, loads of astronomy to happen this year, loads of astronomy to cover, loads of stuff for awesome astronomy to be adding, and it's going to be a very exciting year, so we really, really hope you'll join us. Ralph, any housekeeping announcements you'd like no, to make? absolutely nothing from me. Let's keep it nice and simple. First show of 2013, it's all about astronomy. It's all about astronomy. It's all about awesome astronomy. We're going to keep a clean slate. We'll just say that if you'd like to get in touch with us, and we'd really like to hear from you, join us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. Come along to our Facebook group. We're both there. It's just Awesome Astronomy on Facebook, or send in your questions via the website, Awesome Astronomy. Dot com. I've been Tom presenting this month. Next week, Ralph will be presenting. We very much look forward to transmitting to you then. Until then, bye! bye. Awesome Astronomy is produced by Tom Kerrs and Ralph Wilkins, with music courtesy of Dave Dexter and Star Salzman, and is free to distribute for educational purposes. For more information about this podcast, visit our website at www.awesomeastronomy.com. You can find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Awesome Astro Pod. We invite your questions to read out on our show. You can send them to us through our website, Facebook, or Twitter, 
or email them to us directly via inbox at awesomeastronomy.com. We thank you very much for listening. From Cydonia Base, end of transmission. Jupiter is a terrible house guest. <laughs> it smells funny. <laughs> yeah. It eats all your food. It's full of cats. Full of cats, as I've mentioned before, <laughs> as we've demonstrated here on the Astronomy Podcast. <laughs>